All right. So um, I'm going to share my screen here. And um, let's see here. So for the moment, let's see. All right. Um, so the reason I'm sharing the whole screen is because what I'd like to do here is have slides on one side and uh, a shell session going on the other. Um, hold on a moment here. All right, that'll be that'll be good for YouTube there. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about the the Bash shell and Unix command line. Um, we're going to do this a little bit less formally, and so I'm open to detours if if needed. Um, the other thing I want to say is it, that in order to work everything into the hour, um, it was a little difficult to make this a kind of a linear learning path. So we're going to need to occasionally. Uh, borrow from concepts that we haven't hit in the slides yet. Um, so if we think about the way that we interact with uh, with computers, so um, these days there are mainly two methods. One is with the um, graphical user interface, uh, you know, Windows or Mac OS, uh, at least the graphical portion of it, and then there is the command line, which I, you know, may be new to, to some of you. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I'm not that old, but I am old enough that my, my, when I was really little, my parents um, had stacks of punch cards. That used to be one way that you would uh, interact with the computer. And then I still do remember uh, going to work with my dad, and there was a um, the way you would interact with one of the computers there was it was like a, a keyboard connected to a printer and there was a, a you know you would enter a command to, in a, sort of an interactive shell sort of like what we're going to do today and it would print out and then you know the response would print out it wasn't even a screen so um it fortunately today things are a little bit nicer um you know, in the movies, they always show like hackers working at the command line. So you can feel like that too. And there are not a lot of pictures in this slide deck because frankly, the, the whole nature of working at the command line is, is a very text-based way of interacting with your computer. So why would you want to learn this? Well, um, contrasted with um, pointing and clicking and using, you know, apps uh, to do everything that are more visual, um, you can generally uh, automate a lot of uh, tasks and you can create uh, ways to scripts, for example, to, to do that in a reproducible man manner. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, if you're interacting with a computer that's not your own physical computer, uh, but re a remote one, that may often be the, the only way to access it um, and, and give directives to that computer. Um, and, you know, it's another tool in your toolkit. And you, you may find that many problems are actually best solved through uh, working at the command line. Um, and it, the Unix or Unix-like family of operating systems, we're, we're not going to go into detail there. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll use the terms interchangeably. Linux is one flavor of a, a Unix-like operating system. Um, they're, so they're the dominant system in, in many uh, contexts. So uh, at least according to um, some of the uh, figures cited on, on Wikipedia, of all the public web servers that we interact with, 72% of them are on servers that are running uh, some form of Unix and overall 40% are running Linux. Um, so the, the proportion running, let's say, Windows server is, is smaller. Um, there's been a convergence in the last few years where basically all supercomputers are, are running Unix type operating systems. And then Android, which uh, at least across the world is the more prevalent 
operating system on smartphones and tablets is a, is a form of a Unix type operating system. So I, I would say also, you know, I, before I came to GW, I spent a few years at um, a software company that was doing everything on, on Windows servers and in that kind of in Windows environment. And I don't think too many people there had like command line skills. I could be wrong, but so like, yeah, yes, there are ways to, um, you know, work in coding that where you wouldn't ever have to do this. But I would say that that's probably in the minority and having this skill really, um, you know, rounds your skill set. Um, and, you know, you don't want to limit yourself. So having this not only in your resume, but just having the skill um, is, is very valuable for um, kind of working in the majority of, of computing environments. So um, it, now in terms of kind of systems that we interact with on a regular basis. So on the Mac, you can open a, um, a ter terminal app session and you've got uh, basically a flavor of, of Unix like Macs, Mac OS. Um, most of the things we're doing today, you can also do um, on a Mac terminal session. It's not exactly the same, but for like the majority of things will, will work. Um, Windows in the last few years um, has now included with Windows um, something called Windows subsystem for Linux, which you, I think you do have to do some kind of configuration to, to enable that. Uh, Git bash is something you can also install to work on in, in that way. Um, and then of course, many servers um, are such that the a Unix Linux, for example, um, is the, the native operating system on the server in the first place. And so there are, uh, there are different flavors of the shell, which is the interactive um, session that you would use to interact with the operating system. But bash is, is very common. Uh, the max in the last uh, year or two, um, the default is a shell called ZSH um, because I guess bash had gotten, the version of bash running on Macs had gotten quite old. So again, most of the things that we do today will work in, in Z shell as well. Um, so I think that we kind of discussed this. And if you need to establish a session on a remote server, like a, a Unix type server, you can usually use the SSH command followed by the, you know, the path to the server, et cetera, to establish a session on your computer that's really um, uh, sending commands and getting responses from a remote server. And there are other ways to do that as well. Um, and so that would include, for example, if you create a server on Amazon Web Services, um, which is actually what, what I'm going to use today, then that would be one way to connect with it. So if you're not familiar with this uh, way of interacting in the shell, so uh, the, I would say by and large, the commands in the bash shell look kind of like this, where you would have a command that followed by some you know, zero or more arguments. So that, those would be other values that you pass to it as inputs. And then commands can also be uh, written such that they have different options, sometimes called flags, but those are terms might be interchangeable. Um, and options can have values. And we'll see some examples of those. So here, here are a couple of examples. There's a find command. So you would need to tell it, for example, where in the file tree, which we'll discuss in a moment, where to start looking. And then um, what, in this case, we'd say, okay. And the option is that we would add is uh, files with a name that matches this expression anything starting with iris star. Another example would be the copy command. Um, we pass it an option of dash R for to say to do this recursively. And then we need it needs this command happens to need uh, 
two arguments. One is where you're copying from, and the other would be where you're copying to. Okay. So um, let's talk about the file system. So I, I think one, I, I think it is fair to assume that we all are familiar with the fact that our computers are organized in where you have files within folders and then folders can be contained within other folders. So the folder at the top of the tree, we would call the, the root folder and then everything is kind of contained within that. So we're gonna use, um, you know, those of us who've kind of grown up on like Windows, things like that, we tend to use the term folders, but I, I you know, in the, um, you know, like Unix or shell type uh, context, sometimes the term directory is used. So we're gonna use those interchangeably. Um, and we're not gonna get into symbolic links so much today, but I just want you to know that that's out there and that would be sort of like a, an alias or a, a virtual link to a, a file or directory that's elsewhere on the system. And then we're gonna also talk about files or folders having permissions. So those might not be ways that you're used to um, thinking about files and folders if you haven't worked in at the shell. Okay, so let's, let's actually um, start to work in some examples as we um, introduce some of these terms. So I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Um, somebody send me a text if, or if you know, it's not large enough. I'm gonna actually get the chat window up just in case, or just speak up. Okay, so this is my terminal app on the Mac and what I'm going to do is uh, use SSH to connect to a brand new clean server that I, uh, an Ubuntu Linux server that I've created using Amazon Web Services. So I have the command kind of staged here. Uh, so don't, let's not get into the details of that, but now we're, we're, we have a command prompt with that server, okay? Um, first thing you'll notice is it's kind of waiting for us to issue a command. And let's find out. So first of all, we, the command prompt has a context of where you are in the file system. So the first command I wanna introduce you to is PWD, which um, stands for present working directory. So it's telling us the full path to where we are right now, which is in the home folder, which is under the root folder. And then there's a folder under that called Ubuntu. Okay, so by, I guess by default, and, and also there's a concept of different users, which again, we haven't gotten to yet, um, but I'm logged in here as a user called Ubuntu. That's just the default that um, Amazon creates it with. But on other systems, you might, let's say, create a user that corresponds to your name, and then other people would share that server and um, also have accounts and home folders. So let's see what's in this folder. So if we do ls, there's nothing in here. But I will tell you that by adding an option of dash a for all, you, we see that there actually are some hidden files. So by default, LS doesn't show us any files starting with dot. So we tend to reserve those dot files for um, you know, sort of administrative files, if you will, and folders. So um, one thing we can also do, which I tend to do almost as a you know, default, is I use LS-L. Well, there's nothing here actually to look at, but we'll, we'll create some content. So, and, and then we'll see. So um, why don't we, um, let's see here. So I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna use um, echo, which essentially just prints out some, some text. So we'll say test and it just returns that. And what I'm gonna do is use the greater than symbol to redirect the output of that 
command into a brand new file. So I'll say test.txt. All right. So now if I do an ls, let's say dash l, I see that I actually I have a file here, test.txt. And there's a lot, there's some other information about this file. We're going to talk about the permissions bits in a bit, no pun intended. Um, and then it tells me about who owns this file. Um, and I have a date and time stamp of the last time this file was modified. Um, let's also, while we're thinking about this, um, why don't we move around a little bit? So we saw that we're in home Ubuntu. Let's move to the top of the tree and look around. So we're gonna CD change directory and we can specify where we wanna land. So we could say CD slash, and that's gonna put us in the root directory. So let's take a look at what's here, ls-l. So we have a bunch of directories and, and perhaps for another time we can explore what each of these is. This is just the way that Amazon set up this server. Um, we'll notice that these are not owned by me. These are owned by root, uh, which is sort of the, um, system uh, super user with the highest privileges. And, um, and we can move into any of these uh, directories and look around. So why don't we look under um, you know, there. And notice I, I, I can start the path with a slash, which represents an absolute path relative to the root of the tree or I can not include the slash and that is a relative path relative to where I am. So if I look in here, so I have some other stuff here. I, you know, these are um, sort of administrative files, but I just wanna show you the notion of get moving around. Now I can move around, let me skip a slide here. I can also move up from where I am by saying cd dot dot, and that will always move one level up. And I can also move home. I can say just cd with nothing after it. And I'll notice that I'm in home Ubuntu. And another um, alias for my home directory is tilde. And we'll, we'll see how that comes in handy as well. Okay, so other things we can do. Um, so let's see what we have here in the home directory. So I can make a directory. So I could say mkdir and then just decide on the name. Let's call it test dir for test directory. And let's take a look at what we have. I'm gonna add the h option in the, to the ls command. h uh, stands for human readable um, in terms of these file sizes. So we'll see what that does. So it, um, actually let's add the A so we can put those all together. So now it's expressed in terms of kilobytes where the files are larger than, um, you know, one. So we see that we have this directory and we can perhaps um, move the file that we created test.txt, we can move it there. So let's try that, MV for move. And then we need to say what the file is. So we have a couple of choices. If we move it to um, a name that doesn't exist yet, that's equivalent to renaming it. Okay, so I could say move it to test1.txt. So now if I, if I look here, I have test.txt is gone because it's been renamed. I can also copy so I can say test1.txt and then I can copy it to text2.txt and we see that we have both. And now what I'd like to do is move perhaps both of these into the folder. So I could say move, test, and here's where we're gonna introduce a new concept of wildcards. So I'm gonna to have to skip a little bit. So I can say test star dot txt and that will match anything that 
starts with text test and has zero or more characters in this spot and ends with .txt. And then I have to say where to move it to, to test DIR. And there we go. Um, what if I wanted to move, so if we ls, and we can actually list what's in a target directory, and we see that it contains those files. Now, what if I wanted to move those back up? I could do something like this. I could move test dir slash star, meaning everything underneath test directory that matches anything. And I, if I wanna say move it to where I am now, we're gonna rely on this concept here where a single dot refers to this directory where I am right now. So if I do that, I see that those files are back here. Okay, um, what are some other things? So we can remove a directory so I can rmdir test directory and it's gone. So now we don't have that directory, um, but I, th I, th I think we've touched on these concepts. So let's, let's do one more thing so we can explore how to do this recursively. So um, let's make that directory again, okay? So we'll move, test, and we're gonna use a different concept of a question mark wildcard, which matches exactly one character. So for example, if I had a test uh, 12.txt, that would not match this. So we're gonna move those into test dir, okay? So what I wanna do is copy everything in test directory to a new directory, test two dir. And it says, it, it, it's complaining saying that I didn't specify to do that recursively. And if I want to move a file, a folder or directory with contents, I'm going to have to do it like that. So I actually hit the up arrow to kind of get to the last command here. So I'll move around and say copy dash R. Now, if I list what I have, I've got two directories. So if I list what's in tester, I get that. And if I look, list what's in test to dir, I get the same stuff because I, I copy. Now, if I wanna remove, let's say the second one, it's also not gonna let me because it's gonna say, hey, it's a directory, it has stuff, but I can remove recursively also. So that's just the way that those particular commands were written. There are certain patterns that you see, I guess, conventions, if you will. Uh, not every command is going to have the same options. Okay. Um, now, as far as file names, we've kept it fairly simple, but sometimes um, you get kind of ugly file names because uh, I don't wanna say ugly, okay, that's judgmental, but files with spaces in them can be a little bit difficult to work with because as you see, we're separating commands and different arguments with spaces. Um, so to make sure that you're not being ambiguous, so for example, let me, let me say, let's create a file. We'll use touch, which creates an empty file. Um, or if a file already exists, it will update the date on that file. So we'll say touch, and we'll put this in quotes, uh, file name with spaces dot, you know, CSV for, so it doesn't even have to have an extension. Let's just leave it alone. So if we do an LS, we see that there is a file, uh, something called file name with spaces. If I wanted to move that to a file name that perhaps is easier to work with, if I just start typing file name with spaces to file, uh, let's call it you know, file one, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna say, okay, I think you wanna move file, some, a file called file to a file called name because it's space separated. And obviously it's, it's, it's not liking that. It thinks I wanna move four different files to a directory called file one. So what I need to do, one option is to use quotes to contain that, and then that works. The other would be, I can use backslashes to say that the, in this case, the space that follows 
um, the backslash is meant to be taken literally as part of the file name. So that, that also works. Um, so you just have to know how to handle those situations. All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about wild cards. Here are some more examples. So ex wild uh, star s would match things like examples, exits, x's, exs. And then the, the question mark indicates just a single character that it has to match. Um, so if we want to look at files, then we can use, um, we can dump out to the console um, parts of the files. If we really want to edit files, um, so if let's say you're on your, your Mac or Windows machine, um, you certainly can use apps on the desktop to edit the files that you're interacting, the same files you're interacting with um, at, the, at the command line. But when you're in a, a shell session like this, let's say that's where in this case, we're, we're not, we're connecting to a remote computer that doesn't have a graphical user interface running. Um, we would need to use an editor that works all within the shell session here. So um, nano is one that's, um, I guess, a little bit lower learning curve because it, it provides you with um, sort of guidance as far as what uh, keys to hit. Um, Vim or VI is another one that that is quite common. I, I would say that the learning curve is a little um, steeper, but it's it's probably a bit more powerful. So th those are some choices and there, there might be others out there. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of jump ahead a little bit so that we have some content to work with. So what I'm gonna do is use, um, a couple, there are a couple of options if we wanna pull down or download um, files from URLs from on the internet. So there's wget and curl. We don't need to get into the precise differences about them today, but you know we could just start using them and you can of course read about them. So what I have here is, is a link, uh, Project Gutenberg um, provides um, the text as text of like classic, you know, old fashioned novels. And so we're gonna just pull down uh, Jane Austen here from this link here, which if we go to the internet, we would just sort of see that as plain text. Um, so if we use wget, it just pulls it right down. So it reached out to the internet. And if we look now, we have this file called 1342-0.txt. So let's let's kind of go back to where we left off. All right. I would like to rename that. So I'm going to move it. So we'll say 1342 and I can hit tab for text completion. Let's call it Jane underscore Austin dot txt. Okay, very good. So I can do things like to look at the, the beginning and the end, I could say head Jane Austen. So, you, you know, similar commands like you're used to using in uh, like pandas and tail would do the same thing. If I use cat, cat is really meant to take multiple arguments and then you would use the uh, redirect operator to merge those into a single file, but it can also be used to just, um, uh, render the contents of a, of a file into the console. So if we do that, the entire thing scrolls by. We can also use a command like more, which does the same thing, except it lets us sort of paginate through by hitting the space bar. So you see there's the text of the novel. Um, some other um, interesting things we can do, um, we can do a, word, line, and character count with a command called wc. And again, the idea isn't that you're gonna remember every single command. I just wanna, if you're not familiar with the bash shell, I wanna give you a flavor for what it's like to work in the bash shell, what types of things you might be able to do even at a basic level. 
So that's gonna, that's, this is telling us there are 14,580 lines, um, this many words and this many characters. And WC also has some flags if we wanna just isolate one of those. Like if I only care about lines, I could use dash lowercase l, okay? Um, and then you can sort lines in a file. You can use something called unique to kind of crunch down if there are repeats of certain lines. Um, and then often you'll, you'll encounter files that are zipped up using um, the GNU uh, tool called gzip and gunzip. So you would need to use those to uncompress or compress files in that format. Um, if you need, if you have files that are compressed using the the standard zip and unzip, you you would install those tools. Those don't come by default, and we'll talk about how to install those. Okay, um, so that gives you a little bit of taste of kind of how to work with files, and I just want to show you, you know, if I if I was to edit this file using Nano, so you know, I, I I'm not really a nano user, but I'm kind of moving around with the arrow keys. And then down here, I've got some hints about how to get in and out. So control X exits, and I don't want to save it. Where if I use VI, looks kind of more like this. And I would recommend just finding a cheat sheet online for the keyboard controls and having that handy until they become muscle in our memory. So I'm just kind of paginating through this. All right. Um, let's look at permissions for a moment. So what's all this stuff over on the left here? So, um, you know, if, if you're not a, a frequent user of the, um, of these types of systems, uh, you're probably not used to thinking in terms of permissions on files and, and ownership. So, um, the, the permissions bits over here are, starting from the left, the D tells you if the item is a directory. And here we get some nice color coding, but the D also tells us that. The next three characters, R, W, and X, tell us whether or not um, this user, and in this case, the Ubuntu user, has the permissions to read, write, or execute this file. Um, if it's just got a dash, it means you don't have that permission. The next three bits um, indicate whether members of the group that owns this file. So there's, there are users and users are members of groups. So let's say there was a different user that we created that was also a member of the Ubuntu group. They would have you know, certain rights, like on these files, they'd be able to write to the file, either modify it or remove it. Um, but the last three digits are for the world, so to speak. In other words, um, users who are not members of this, the group that owns this file. Um, and in, that, in this case, those people, those users would not be able to um, write to the file or, or delete it, but they would be able to read it. So, um, and we'll talk about over, overriding that when necessary. So let's, let's imagine that we wanted to, um, you know, we had a file that was owned um, by Ubuntu and for some reason we wanted to make it owned by the root user. So let's just change file one. So we have a couple of commands for modifying the ownership and the permissions. So let's, let's actually do ch uh, change owner uh, last. Okay, yeah, so change, let's change the mode, meaning the, the flags here. So for, let's say, uh, you know, file one, so we could say um, change mode, and then we'll say for group, for the group, we're going to remove uh, read, so, for, so minus instead of plus, read and write for file one. Actually, let's change that to O for the world. I'm not sure why it's O. So now let's look at the, the bits on file one. So we see that 
up here it had a read access for the world and here it now it doesn't it's still owned by me so i can still read it if i wanted to um, but now let's let's give it give ownership of this file to the root user in the root group uh, and we have to say which file so it, it's not permitted because I'm, I don't have the rights to make something owned by, by root. So what I need to do is preface that command with sudo, which means do the following as su super user. So perhaps the proper way to pronounce that would be sudo, but people, I don't know, I, I hear sudo. So we're gonna do that and it's gonna, well, it normally asks for my password, but I guess, um, and this, I don't have it set up that way. Often it will ask for your password. So that's a way to force it. Now you have to be, your user has to be a member of the sudoers group in order to have the rights to sudo. So, um, and that's, that's depends on the way that your user is set up. Um, perhaps talk about that another time. So if we look at the file now, file one is owned by root. And if I want to look at it, let's say I want to just, you know, cat the file to see what's in there, it says permission denied because I don't have the permissions to, to look at it. Okay, so um, as, as we were discussing, the root, root is the super user. Um, I can be another user, really, there aren't any other users on the system right now, but if I have pseudo rights, I could uh, do something like this sudo su dash another user. And then I have like a shell within a shell that uh, where I am that other user logged in as the other user. Or I can just say sudo su and it's a little, you know, living on the edge here, but I'm the root user now. So I pretty much have rights to like modify anything. Um, not generally something you wanna kind of do all the time, but it, sometimes it's, it's needed. So let's, Let's leave that right now. Um, now let's say we wanna learn more about some of these commands. So some, not all commands have a manual page. Um, I actually remember a, a summer job in college where we had these manual pages printed out in a three ring binder. It was actually pretty handy. So um, let's say man, and we wanna learn more about, uh, I don't know, the, um, the, the sudo command, or the, let's say the cat command. So we get a page that we can paginate through. You can you know, hit spacebar or scroll to learn about every possible thing you can do with this command. So, and then some examples generally. Um, and apparently there's a command called tack. I don't know if that's like, let's see what that is. Maybe that's to concatenate backwards. Yeah, concatenate and print files in reverse. Pretty neat. Um, also, many commands are, are written such that they have like a short help available. So uh, cat seems to have that. So this is a much briefer version. Um, so that, that can be handy as well. A dash dash help. Again, if, if it was written that way by the authors. So we talked about downloading from the internet. Um, you know, we use wget to get this novel. Uh, curl can, can do something similar. Um, and so let's, let's use, so find I mentioned is a way to find files within the system. Um, grep is a way to sort of filter through a file and look for uh, matching terms. So, Let's look at Jane Austen. And if we do something like this, grep, and let's look at the word handsome, because I noticed they use it a lot in that book, um, janeaustin.txt. And what that does is that returns only the lines. So this is a, grep is a line by line search, only the lines that contain that word. And we can combine this with some other things we've done. So we could say grep that, and we can redirect that to let's say handsome.txt. And if we now uh, 
use cat to look at, or let, let's even just use, you know, head to look at the first few lines of handsome.txt, you'll see that that's the first, you know, several lines of, of the output there. Um, other, now, another way of chaining things together would be so we could grab handsome from Jane Austen using this vertical bar or pipe character, which says use the output from the command coming from the left side as the um, sort of the, the content, the argument that the next command is going to use. So we're going to pipe it to that word count uh, command and we'll use the dash L um, flag to just say, oh, okay, well, I'm only interested in number of lines. And so it tells us that there were 46 lines um, in the result returned by grep. So this idea of chaining things together and redirecting can be very powerful. And you know, you're probably, if you think about it, if you didn't have the command line, how would you do this kind of stuff with just the graphical user interface? I mean, you'd have to have kind of like apps for, for the specific purposes. Okay, um, just a quick handy thing. If we look at history, that's all the commands that we've run and, and we can you know, kind of rerun ones that we ran before with exclamation mark and referencing the number. So, all right. Um, so I, I mentioned, for example, that um, we, yeah, that, that um, we would, we might need to install, like I think the example was the zip uh, program or zip and unzip. So how do you install stuff here? Well, uh, one, there, one way to do it is many programs um, have kind of a recipe available for installation that, uh, that tells, tells the system how to install it um, through something called apt, which is uh, something package, uh, I don't remember what that, that stands for, but uh, well, let's say man apt, yeah. Okay, well, it, it's an acronym, and I think the P is for packages. So um, there are other package management systems in Linux environments. I came across, I, I think Snap is another one that's, uh, that's becoming popular. Um, so th th essentially, um, there, is a, there, there is a list of websites that um, apt, the apt command reaches out to, and each one is sort of a copy of a, a listing of, diff, of these different recipes. So <clears throat> first thing we, we do need to do, and generally we need to do this as sudo, is update, first of all, that list of um, kind of the catalog of, of recipes, because that changes all the time as new versions are released and new apps are become available. Um, and so it tells us that 46 packages that we already have installed can actually be upgraded. There are new versions available. So we can do that, sudo apt upgrade, and it tells us which ones, and we'll go ahead and, and do that. Um, on a Mac, you don't have apt that I'm aware of, but there, uh, one package management system is brew that you can look up and install, I think, at brew.sh. Um, so many, ma uh, many tools are available through the brew uh, system and it kind of works in a similar fashion. Um, and there are others. So I'll show you in a second how we might um, install something from app. So as an example, um, I don't believe that we have the Python interactive shell available here. So we need to install that. Because as I, I started this uh, as, a, as a fairly clean server with not, not too much on there. Okay. And then we'll talk about scripting. And then I think that's quite a lot to talk about for today, uh, but we can perhaps have future sessions uh, with more to talk about. Um, actually, while we're waiting for this to finish here, 
why don't we talk about scripting? So, you know, we've done individual commands, but let's say that we wanted to sort of repeat and or automate um, some of what we're doing. So essentially we can create a text file that is a, a program written using these, um, the, these bash commands. And then we can run that as a program. And it, it has kind of the features of, of you know, a basic uh, coding language. Okay, so that finished. If we type Python, it says it's not found, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna try to install it here. So we'll take a guess, sudo apt install Python. So it says, okay, this is what it's gonna install. So we say yes. So it's, it's grabbing Python from the internet and it just installed it. So if I say Python now, I get a Python interactive shell. I have to quit. Um, and I think that also comes with Python 3 as well. So we see 3.8.5. And then if I created a small Python program, let's just use VI here, uh, test.py. I could say print, this is a test and just save that out. I could say Python three test.py and there it is. Okay, so you, you kind of get the idea of how to install these packages. So let's look for a moment at an example of a script that, that I had to write. Um, and we're not gonna go through all the syntax, maybe that's its own workshop but I just wanna give you a flavor of the types of powerful things you can do by, by automating these commands and, and grouping them together. So um, I had uh, a couple of thousand um, scans as TIFF files and I needed to convert them to PDFs and in some cases compress them. So these files were organized in certain folders and I also needed to um, look at how large the compressed, the converted PDF file was. And if it was larger than a certain threshold, I wanted to try it again, but with 50% quality so that the file would be smaller. So we see that what we can do here, so the arguments that we pass to, the, to a command uh, we can access them as variables that start with a dollar sign. And then like the, let's say the, the command itself would be the zeroth argument, but you can have dollar one, dollar two, and you'll see that that shows up here. So that dollar one would be the first argument. And we can do things like if clauses, if then clauses, where what's inside is executed if the condition is true. And I know the form, the syntax is a little wonky, but you have, you know, I, I just look these things up. I, I can't, you know, keep track of all the syntax in my head. And then, uh, so in this case, if 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 the person gave anything but exactly one argument, then it prints out a reminder of how to use this command, and then just exits. Otherwise, it continues on, and there's a for loop which you probably are familiar with from you know, other coding languages. And what do we have here? So ls, that's our familiar command that we've been using to list the contents of a directory. So I ran this on my Mac actually. And um, so I was listing all the contents of a folder and notice I incorporated the value of the argument that was passed to the script. Um, matching this certain pattern. So all the TIFF files in that folder. And so that's gonna give me a list of file names with their full paths. And each of those becomes kind of the value of F, this variable I'm creating, each time I run this through the loop that is contained inside the do done clause. So, you know, I print out something just to let the user know what's going on. And then I use this convert program. So that's not something that's native to the system, but it actually apt kind of says, hey, well, it's not found, but I'm aware that it's part of this image magic um, 
package that you can install. So we can do something like this, sudo apt install image magic and let that run. So that installs a set of tools that's handy for um, you know, compressing and converting different image files. There's a lot you can do with it actually. But you, know, it's, you see that convert has its own particular options and flags. And again, I didn't invent this. I kind of looked for some examples and, and got it working for me. And then here we have an example of where I substituted, I took the file name and then substituted um, one thing for another. Again, details, but what this enabled me to do was loop through something like 35 folders containing a total of like 1500 files and just have this thing chug along and automate all of the bash commands, the shell commands that I would have needed to do manually. So again, try that without shell scripting or without working at the shell. You, you would have to have an app that's designed for that, but here you can kind of um, make your own. Um, and in fact, why don't we, so you see, I installed this now, so I could say convert dash dash help and you know here it is so I you know if we wanted to start converting image files we could um, so why don't we make like a one line shell script just to kind of look how it works so we'll say vi um, let's call it args.sh so what it's going to do is we're going to borrow from this technique over here and we'll say echo um, you know you called this command with, um, and we'll say dollar pound, that gives the number of arguments that you passed it, arguments. So that's gonna be the entire script. So we're in a text file here where we edited it. So if we look at now what we have, we have something called args.sh. And if we you know, look at the top of it, here it is. So if we try to run it, it says command not found, but that's weird because I see it. So to run something as a program, you need to set it to have um, X, the executable permissions. So we're gonna use chain, chmod, change mod plus X. So give everybody execute permissions on args.sh. So let's look at it again. So now it's, we've got these X's, okay? So, and the other thing, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but you have to sometimes specify that it's right here. And if we do that, so it runs the program and we can pass it some arguments, A, B, C, D. So basically we've, we've you know, through a text file that contains um, bash uh, commands, we've created a script that we can now run as a program. And, it's, and you know, most of the programs that we run that are native to the um, system, you know, CD, LS, those are all programs too. Some of them are written in C, it's, let's not get into the details there, but um, this is very powerful if you can create your own um, and then kind of run things more reproducibly. So um, I see that we're kind of coming towards the end of the hour, but you know, I know that that was a lot of different things flying by but you know, if you haven't um, if you haven't done this before, or you you know, the, it's it's really a good skill to add to your your skill set. Um, if you want practice with kind of the base, the a little bit more basic stuff like moving around and grep and stuff like that, I would point you to the software carpentry shell novice. Um, uh, lesson, which you can kind of do at your own pace. Um, that's, that's, that's a nice one. Um, yeah, I guess you're not going to learn that much from the manual page on Bash itself, but that was kind of interesting. Um, as GW folks, we have access to LinkedIn Learning, and actually there are quite a few um, videos on there for sort of, it's a little bit more granular, which could be a good thing, about specific um, topics within uh, learning to use the bash shell. So I, I would recommend checking that out as well. Um, and again, if you're at GW, 
um, you can make appointments with um, my colleagues in, and me through the coding consultations link, and we will help you with anything you're trying to do for you know projects um, or work with within the the bash shell I and mean, we'll help with other topics too but that's definitely in our um, capabilities and uh, feel free to email me with with any questions um, and I'll stick around a little bit if anyone wants to chat but I'm gonna um, at least end the recording for now so thanks for attending and if you're watching this on YouTube thanks for watching and um, let's see I have to figure out how to Stop recording. There we go. Okay. Thanks.